We move now to item 7, uh, which is on the Organisational Alignment and Capability Programme. I'll ask uh, Karen to speak to us, but invite Simon, if he wishes to, to say some words by way of introduction. Thank you. So we spoke about this last time. Some of the changes we're making here are changes that we would want to make one year into the organisation in order to adjust in the light of the circumstances we <coughs> find ourselves in. Some of them are changes that we are being required to make in order to reduce our running costs in line with the broader redeployment of cash from back office to frontline health services for 15-16 to, as a contribution to the wider pressures that the NHS is under. So this is a... Um, piece of work that uh, we will be consulting our staff on uh, formally beginning on October 1st and Karen will update you on where things stand. Thank you. Karen. Uh, thanks Simon. Um, yes, so uh, we, just to reiterate, this programme as we talked about last time is um, a combination of, uh, meets a combination of objectives. It's about reviewing where we are in the uh, uh, in the organisation and ensuring that the organisation is geared up to uh, meet its current priorities and has the right capabilities. Um, it's secondly to ensure that it is going to be capable of doing the things that we need to do going forward. Uh, in particular, uh, all of the work that we've been talking about today about the forward plan, for example, is a key area which is only just emerging. Uh, so we shall need to think about that. And the third area is the savings that we don't want to make but do need to make to live within our baselines for 1516. Um, clearly the uh, uh, need to make those savings for 1516 has probably driven us to try to make these changes as quickly as possible so that we could stabilise the workforce as quickly as possible and uh, ensure that the workforce and management are able to continue to manage delivery through winter and for the rest of this year. Uh, so that's driven a tight timescale for making the changes happen. Um, we had hoped to start the consultation slightly earlier as we indicated in the paper but um, have a little bit more to do for ourselves to just confirm that the structural changes that we are making will uh, properly meet our objectives, are clear enough and ensure that we are capable of meeting our uh, both current needs and future needs of the organisation. And that's, that's probably the key area that we're going to be spending some time on over the next week as we finalise these changes uh, prior to the consultation being launched on the 1st of October. Uh, we've already had discussions with the trade unions uh, uh, about this and are very conscious of the staff concerns that clearly one of the biggest risks associated with this is of course the impact on staff and um, uh, the subsequent impact on the uh, continuing successful delivery into uh, both performance issues and all of the work that we've been outlining and discussing today. Um, so that's a key risk. Um, uh, a second key risk I did want to flag is the specific one around whether we have the right resources in the right place for, um, for the future and that's something that we'll be discussing in more detail uh, later and through the next, uh, through the next week. Um, but hoping to provide assurance to all of ourselves and to you before we start the formal consultation. Um, I think that's probably all I really wanted to say. The content is in the paper. I would have hoped to have been able to provide you with more detail about the actual numbers uh, at this stage, but uh, again, that's some detail that we're still refining. Um, our original estimates of the numbers of staff who might have been affected were uh, something over 600 of posts that might have been affected. It appears that the numbers that we're working on will be significantly less than that, but that's, that's what I'm not able to confirm today, and we will be tightening that up and confirming it over the next, uh, over the next week or so. 
uh, I think that's all I really wanted to say. Karen, thank you very much for that. Um, let me invite uh, observations from members of the board. I think I heard something sort of voce from the Deputy Chairman, but I'll pass on to Kieran. I think we've always said that 18 months on we'd look at the organisation because the chance of having designed the right structure you know, from a blank sheet was not going to be high, so completely get that and agree with it. But the, you, know, you could even convince me that 15% of our resources wouldn't have been in the right place. But I, I just, I'm just grumpy about the slightly arbitrary uh, nature of what we've been asked to do and told to do, um, and particularly from the point of view of staff who you know, had quite a difficult time being reorganised two years ago, and now there's the prospect uh, of that again, and there's the distraction from the day job at a critical time, at exactly the time of going into planning. So, just to register grumpiness, I'm afraid, Chairman. Well, I'm not unaccustomed to it, but um, <laughs> uh, no, I think it's a, it's a very valid point, and it may be that Victor wishes to, to build on that. Yeah, I, I think that's I think it is a good point. I think there's an impact of episodic change on organisational culture, which um, is redolent throughout the history of the NHS. People get used to surviving it, and, and that is in itself a major risk. Uh, I might make another point, which is that it strikes me that yesterday, when we had the... Um, the, the experience of the NHS citizens, um, I am still concerned about how that um, experience is reflected in the alignment of the organisation. Um, I can understand the structural form and the need to do it. It's pragmatic. I get it. don't particularly like it. It is what it is. What I am concerned about is the loss of an opportunity to embed or to start the culture values alignment in in keeping with our sta stated actions publicly that's the bit that really worries me because it, it could undermine everything that we've said about how we want to operate I don't know whether Ed wants to come in yeah I mean I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with those earlier comments I just wanted to ask whether Given what happened when we formed our own diversity of our staff, can we have particular attention paid to the, diver the diversity impact of these changes too? Okay. Ed, did you want to? Um, I don't know, make a two points. One, I suspect given the speed and the nature of what we did when we did it, it's inconceivable that we could have got everything right. Um, and I think that part of what we are doing is putting things right, uh, which uh, with the reflection of time and if given more time, uh, we might have done differently. And I think it's quite important to identify that uh, and, uh, and, and the benefits of knowledge of, of operating the system um, differently. I think uh, the second point is nobody likes to be told what to do. Uh, we need to know if that is what we are having to do, uh, and you know, lots of organisations are having to do it, what we therefore have to give up doing, um, because it's not just about doing everything we did before with uh, a lot less, it's about being having an honest conversation <laughs> about we simply cannot do X or Y anymore, um, because without that conversation uh, our accountability is shot. Um, thank you. David, Malcolm, maybe just to build on that point from Ed, I think in, uh, as we discussed at the Audit Committee, I think it's important that we embed and under or understand the nature in which financial controls and other controls are being changed as a consequence of the organisational realignment and that we can be satisfied that the new control environment is robust and can be embedded quickly where things have changed. Right, I think all very valuable points and um, we will watch very closely uh, its work in progress. So, did, did you want to? I, so yes, I please. To some of those yes. points. So I, I think um, uh, it's really important to give you as much assurance as we can on all of those. 
uh, points, of course, and I completely accept. Uh, I think uh, we were equally grumpy about the numbers and uh, uh, would not have, as Simon said, would not have chosen to do this. We would have chosen to make some changes to the organisation, but not in terms of stripping out the level of numbers and resources that we are doing. Um, and it is causing some difficult decisions. There is no question about it. Every single directorate, national directorate, and the field force are having to make some really difficult decisions. Um, that does have a, uh, a consequence uh, for us all, which is about one, one of the things that became very clear when I joined the organisation was the general um, question by everybody about what is this organisation for, what's it really about, and what's its core purpose. And in a sense, everyone is having to really focus on what are we really here for, what is really fundamentally important, and using that to make the choices where those choices are being made. So it is, it's not good, but it is helping us to make some of those choices. Um, and we need to be clear about that because there are some things that we are going to have to stop doing um, and there are certainly also things that we are still going to do but do less of um, and they're quite important things and we need to ensure that everybody understands those so for example I know Barbara would say that in the field um, the field force is going to be uh, reduced there will be fewer senior people across the patch in the field force they will be covering wider geographies and as a result of that they simply won't be able to go to every single health and well-being board and every single safeguarding board they will though prioritize those which are absolutely important in challenged and difficult economies and circumstances so we will be more focused in how we work um, we are also trying to work together on how we can work more efficiently and effectively across our organisation. That was always one of the key objectives of the stock take that uh, I did with Ros Routon when I first came in and that Simon asked me to do. Um, and uh, some of that is about us joining up more effectively, working across the organisation more effectively and efficiently and thereby being able to uh, avoid some duplication uh, and some confusion in the way that we're working and those are the, the opportunities that we are able uh, I think to, to take. Um, it doesn't answer everything that we need to do. I mean I wanted to come back to Victor's point because that is um, absolutely important that we take the opportunity, we're naturally focusing right now uh, because we need to on the structural changes which are putting posts and people at risk uh, and that is the primary focus right now of this change program but we have done quite a lot of work on how we need to operate differently as an organization and more corporately as an organization and uh, we have uh, more work to be done around that and I though that doesn't specifically address the points that you make Victor, what is really important and what came out from yesterday uh, and all of our engagement I think uh, with NHS Citizen is the need to build that closeness uh, to the patient in everything that we do and also uh, to change ourselves, our own culture for the way that we operate so that we can also uh, influence the culture in the wider NHS because I think that's what came out so strongly yesterday. So there is a lot more that we need to do. Um, we haven't embedded that into plans yet but I do think that uh, we still have the opportunity to do that in the way that we implement the changes that we're going forward. So it's not a lost opportunity. I think we need to take that opportunity still. Um, uh, finally, I just wanted to touch on, we did have a really useful session with our Audit and Risk Committee on uh, the risks and controls. I think we're all very conscious that we are not in a strong position as we would like to be in any case on our control environment. There is a lot more change that needs to be done and indeed some of the change that we have specifically identified 
um, as part of the stock take and as part of this piece of work is to improve those controls. And some of those are to improve controls, but also to um, uh, streamline and improve flexibility and our ability uh, to get our business done. So procurement is a very good example where we are looking to streamline and um, I won't say reduce control, but certainly reduce the complexity and the bureaucracy associated with the, the, the processes that we have in place. And I think by doing that we will improve our controls, make it more efficient and uh, uh, give the business a, a better opportunity to procure more effectively. Uh, but that is one of the work streams in our overall programme that we are certainly continuing to do and there will be a lot more work uh, to be done along those lines. Um, to just provide a little bit more assurance around the specific risk though, um, one thing I think that is important is that while these changes are um, they are quite significant in terms of the numbers of people affected. We're not fundamentally changing the nature of our organisation structure. Um, every national director who has accountability for controls and delivery responsibilities continues to have those. It is absolutely essential that every national director, and I know they are doing this, um, makes sure that as they make their changes that they are still capable of executing their accountabilities and responsibilities uh, and we would be wanting to be assured that they uh, still have those arrangements in place. There is some further assurance that we are going to be doing as a team to make sure that those controls which require working across directorates, so in particular where national directors require work to be done um, in the field and therefore we need to be assured that we can still uh, deliver on those accountabilities um, uh, uh, despite re resources being reduced across the organisation. I am not saying that there isn't a risk there because there clearly is as we take resource out and make these changes happen. Uh, we are very, very conscious of them uh, and we will be ensuring that as we manage, we're putting all of this under a single programme board and we will will be managing those risks and, and watching those risks very carefully as we go through the rest of the implementation. Thank you, Carolyn. Just to invite Barbara to say a few words about, so far as the field force is concerned, if we are withdrawing from activity, how that results in a realignment of responsibilities with CCGs and other players. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I think that's really important. Um, and, and if I can say first, I, I do know colleagues out there um, aren't terribly keen on the term field force. Um, I, I understand that, but I think what is absolutely vital is that we have a way of describing you, those of you who are watching us, um, because it's, you, you are such an absolutely in, incredibly essential component of what we do. Um, so apologies if it's a term you don't like, but it is a term which has meaning to us, and therefore I will just carry on to use it and until we get a better alternative. Um, and I'd, I'm sure that those colleagues in the field force will kind of welcome, Ed, what you said about the organisation needing to be clear what its focus is, um, needing to be clear on some of the things that they can stop doing or can, uh, can be uh, less of a priority. Because it is very hard. There, are, um, sm there were small numbers in the first instance spread uh, um, across the geography. Um, it, you know, the reorganisation meant that whereas once upon a time individuals were all together um they're now in several organisations, so individuals who work together in a geography are now um, working in NHS England, Public Health England, TDA. Um, so there are small, there were small numbers in the beginning, and this reduction um, will add to uh, the strain that they are feeling. And we, as an organisation and as a leadership team, need to be very clear about um, priorities and where they need to put their time. Um, a couple of things that I do think that I need to say that are really important is that we have tried to make sure that um, by creating a single tier, we had two tiers theoretically, the regional teams and the area teams, um, and we have tried to uh, ensure that actually by reducing down to one tier, that actually what we were taking out was some of the waste. Um, I'm sure everybody out there was working and we were working really hard, but there was quite a bit of duplication, and therefore hopefully that efficiency um, will help us, and therefore we won't just be putting a strain on uh, fewer people doing uh, the same amount of work. Um, 
Um, the other thing I think that is important to remember is the changing nature of CCGs, um, because when the uh, the organisation was set up, CCGs were very immature organisations. There were great concerns about whether they'd be able to step up to the plate, uh, and and I think to some extent there was a bit of a, a feeling that we had to create our area teams were the recreation of PCTs, whereas in reality the CCGs are the recreation of the of the CCGs, and I think so. Therefore, the maturity of the CCGs, coupled with the changing nature, our direction of travel, a primary care, co-commissioning, other aspects of co-commissioning, then it's really important that, that our field force steps back and ensures that it does its major role. We've still got a significant role in direct commissioning, although more of that is moving to CCGs, but our role in supporting and assuring CCGs is a greater one, not doing for them um, what they now in many places have so ably um, uh, identified that they can do for themselves. And that will include the representation of the key boards that Karen was talking about, such as the health and wellbeing boards and the safeguarding boards. NHS England has a statutory responsibility for safeguarding, and therefore we will still need um, to ensure that the right presence um, covers that and we have the right level of involvement uh, in health and wellbeing boards. Um, but what we need to do is to ensure that where appropriate, CCGs can take on more responsibility, um, and we need to start to be discerning <coughs> Um, about where and when we put uh, where we would uh, put our efforts um, for those CCGs who we feel are absolutely confident um, to represent on health and wellbeing boards. As I say, we have a statutory responsibility for safeguarding boards, which is different. Um, but where we will put our, um, our efforts in um, in supporting CCGs and where we will need to have a greater intervention. And I think if the field force are here, they would say that in terms of the overarching CCG assurance process, it will be absolutely critical that they can be discerning as for which CCGs they need to give a lot of support to and which CCGs have shown themselves to be very very capable um, of being the local focus, the local voice of their communities, remembering of course that they're the ones who have local meetings in public and therefore the more decisions that are made by um, the CCGs then the more there is local uh, accountability to the population. So I, I do think that, you know, I wouldn't, don't want to underestimate that there are significant risks um, in uh, reducing our staff numbers uh, by this number but we've got a lot of mitigations and I think the way it's been done in the field force um, and, and a changing approach to how we do business and um, hopefully we'll be able to allow us to deliver all we want to do. Thank you Barbara. Margaret. Um, it's absolutely right that the CCG should um, take on the responsibilities as described by Barbara but in, in my mind um, I see a completely different um, uh, field of operation from um, res residing with the area teams um, in in that they are the assurance side of things. So they're not, it's not that they're supporting or duplicating what the CCG is doing. It's the, the, the CCGs are carrying out an executive function. The area teams have a, an, an oversight and assurance role on our behalf, really. And I just, you know, if, if we take, for example, looking at the forward plan, the um, individual care um, programme suggests quite a lot of activity at ground level um, and you know, if you if, if you take that particular program, for example, the potential for I don't know fraudulent networks springing up and and, and undermining the integrity of, of what one's trying to establish there is 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 a possibility. I I just like some sort of comfort, please, that we have the right number and and, and the right uh, um, level. Of, of support to ensure the assurance and oversight of, of what we're doing um, to make sure that the, the, the forward plan works as it should. Um, forgive me if that sounds a, 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 like a little bit too much detail, but... No, not I, at all. I think that's a really, really valid question. Of course, the, the field force, and if I can call it that, which was once, which, which currently is made up of regional teams and area teams, but in the future will be a single integrated tier um, which provides oversight and assurance and, and we and, and you know some would say that the two tiers has been too many layers of assurance and oversight um, but that field force will have a huge range of things that it needs to deliver on behalf and supported by the National Support Centre on behalf of NHS England assurance will be its, its major role um, but so you know in, in terms of many of the things we want to see happen you know the 
relationships with patients and the public, uh, quality of care, experience of care, um, all the things we were talking about the planning in the planning round, the uh, major targets. It will we will re be relying on CCGs and their relationships with their local communities to deliver those for us. And NHS England needs to be sure that that is happening um, rather than necessarily step in and try and do it as an alternative. But we will also still have a direct commissioning function. So as well as that assurance of CCGs, um, the field force will still need to make sure that in its direct commissioning function it's doing all the things, some of which um, you've already talked about. So the role is changing in terms of emphasis and it's changing in terms of scale as CCGs mature, but it is not fundamentally changing in what we do, which is we, um, you know, we have responsibility for making sure that the whole of the commissioning system, whether it's our direct commissioning, um, whether it is the oversight of CCGs, whether it is the way the CSUs support our direct commissioners and CCGs, the whole of that commissioning system, um, we can be assured and assure you that it's doing everything that it needs to. Heavy and so one specific additional observation is that as well as providing assurance around the system, just connecting this conversation to the earlier one on the forward view and Kieran's comments in particular around capacity and <coughs> capability for change, there will continue to be a very important role for the field force in the NHS working with our partners and their field forces and things like the academic health science networks, strategic clinical networks and senates to think about how they can collectively catalyse local system improvement. And I would just wanted to emphasise that that transformational role is really critical alongside the assurance function. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, just a, a, a talk really to explore more um, as we get through this. So there is, a, so in my experience, a bit of a tendency when, when organisations go through this for um, people to go into the shell of this is now my job. Um, and I'm not going to look outside my shell. Uh, and actually, the, the reflex of leadership has to be to create exactly the opposite set of behaviours, that the porosity of boundaries starts to, 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 to increase uh, so that people go, how can I help, who can I help, uh, how do we do this together? Uh, and so if I can just suggest that as we go through this process, it starts in this room and it starts with our teams to, 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 to not... Um, if we see people going into there, uh, this is my job and, and it's not um, my job to do anything else other than this, uh, that we push against that and we try and engage a spirit of, of collective collaboration across all of your national directorates and all of the field force and, and other parts of the organisation. It's just a natural tendency, I think, to, to go the other way. Thank you, Ed. I think that's been an immensely valuable discussion. I think the board identifies and, and, and understands the extent of risk that's inherent in this exercise. Uh, but I feel that the comments that the board has made and the responses that you've given us have given us a, a sufficient level of assurance. Um, but something that we we'll want to watch very closely uh, over, the, over the coming phases of it. So thank you, Karen, for the paper. Uh, we now move to item 8 on the agenda, which is simply for noting the board committee feedback. Uh, and then item 9, uh, which I think is any other business, which is the date of the next meeting, which will be in Leeds on the 6th of November. I've not been notified of any other business that any member of the board would wish to raise. And since that's the case, I have only one other request. I had only one other, but I have a further one, Tim. Just one very small thing that people may be interested to um, go onto the NHS England website where they can find a version of the annual report that I hope is more, gives a better narrative of some of the impact NHS England has had over the last year. That's called the annual review and it can be downloaded from our website. Thank you very much. We'll take that home. Um, my only other request to assure you was the formal one that we now move into a meeting for confidential business. Thank you very much. The meeting is closed. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending with us this morning.